Last time we covered how you can approach a steady state AC current problem or AC electricity problem. Uh, that is if the uh, AC problem is all single frequency. But anyway, if you, if you have that kind of a problem where it's a steady state single frequency problem, I showed you how you can approach that. And uh, kind of the first two steps is to try to take whatever circuit that might be given to you and put it in a particular form. And so the two steps toward doing that typically are that you have to take any components that are passive components, that would be resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and try to express those in terms of uh, complex impedances, right? Which means that if you have any of those that are just plain components that where you know things like farads or Henry's, that kind of thing, uh, it means that you're also going to need a frequency in order to be able to convert those to complex uh, impedances. So that's part of it. And then the other part of it is uh, you have to convert any sources that are given in terms of time domain kind of expressions. You have to get those converted into frequency domain. And another way of saying that is to express those as phasers, right? So the uh, kind of form of that gives you an amplitude with a phase angle and we can work in that domain that's called frequency domain. So that's just a couple of review comments. Today we're going to try to use uh, our, our techniques that we have already developed for DC and apply those to AC because the only thing that really changes as we do this is we start using complex numbers as opposed to using just plain old real numbers. And so uh, all the same methods still apply but there is one big difference, I suppose, particularly with respect to a technique like nodal analysis, and that is that with nodal analysis, especially if you have a bigger circuit, it often leads to a system of equations. Uh, most of you do not have calculators that are, uh, as a matter of fact, none of you have calculators that are allowed on the test that uh, are able to do those systems of equations sort of automatically like they could for the real numbers, you know, for the complex numbers. And so I'm going to show you how you can get through one of these uh, analyses using just your calculator. Um, and so anyway, we'll get right into it here. Here's the example. Um, we have a circuit that's shown right here that originally uh, was set up in such a way that it had uh, two sources and those two source values are given here and uh, they are expressed already in terms of phasers. So there's no uh, conversion that we have to do with that. And originally it was set up with all four of these uh, complex impedances. And so for those, there's really not much we have to do with that either. But let's say that instead of just connecting Z4 over to this node that's on top of this voltage source over here, someone came in and inserted several components in there. Um, and now the circuit has changed as a result. So I've got some of these that are expressed in terms of complex impedances. And then I've got some components here where I just happen to know what their kind of raw values are for those components, okay? Um, what we need to do is find a voltage phasor across the current source. That's this one over here, I sub S, right? So I'm trying to figure out what is that voltage across that current source over there. Um, and, you know, there's actually probably not just one method that would be acceptable to do this problem with, but the one that I want to show you today is, is the nodal analysis method. And so I'm going to get started with that. Um, if we look at kind of our steps that I mentioned up there at the top of the screen, what do you think our first step might need to be for this circuit? Okay, it says all of the passive components in your circuit have been expressed with complex impedances. Have all of the components been expressed that way? Okay, so what I would say is, um, in terms of what we are trying to find here, what we probably need to do is come up with uh, what is the combination of these added components that we have up here with Z4, right? So that's going to be my first step is basically find an equivalent impedance for that upper uh, branch, okay? So that's going to be my first step. In order to do that, let me actually take this circuit and copy it. And I'm going to kind of try to redraw it, okay? Instead of having all of this stuff up here, what I'd like to do is replace all of that with just one box that is ZEQ, right? 
And by doing this, it doesn't cause me to lose any of the nodes that I needed in my circuit to be able to find what it's asking me to find, right? So that's kind of a, a key point there, is that if you end up losing one of the key points that you need to find, that's sometimes not a good idea to try to do uh, an equivalent impedance altogether in those cases. But what I'm trying to find is the uh, voltage across the current source, and so that didn't go away as a result of me combining these into an equivalent impedance. All right, what do you think might be next? I need to find that ZEQ up there. So what's maybe my first step toward finding ZEQ? How about if I look, you know, this is essentially kind of a, a little network of um, elements up here. So I can try to combine those just using series and parallel rules like we've always done for our different components. And uh, what it looks like to me might be easiest is to first try to combine my two capacitors, right? When you have capacitors that are in parallel, how do they combine? Okay, yeah, they're opposite of resistors. And so, you know, where resistors, when you have them in parallel, you gotta do the reciprocal, the sum of the reciprocals. But with capacitors, you can just sum them. Okay, so if we we're trying to find what the equivalent uh, impedance is for the capacitors, right? I'm gonna call that Z sub C. What we can do is just use our formula that we had for, or for uh, complex impedance for a capacitor and do minus J over omega C. And for the C, I'm gonna say this is my CEQ, right? That's my equivalent uh, capacitance that I have right there that I can find just by adding. Well, what do I need to be able to do this piece, like this Z sub C right here? What do I need to have to do that? Omega, right? How do I find omega? Okay, well, I'm told up here that sources VS and IS both operate at 9.2 kilohertz. Okay, so that is something that I can work with in order to find what this omega is. But be careful, you don't want to just plug it right in for omega because omega needs to be in radians per second. And if you have something that is expressed in hertz or some multiplier of hertz, what is that? Okay, that's it, that's cycles per second. So what I need to probably do is take a little uh, kind of detour here for just a second and say omega is equal to 9200, right? That's 9.2 kilohertz. It's 9200 hertz. Hertz is cycles per second. And the, uh, the other piece that we need is to convert that, right? Two pi radians uh, per, excuse me, not radians per second, radians per cycle, right? So if you go ahead and punch those things in, you'll end up with a particular value. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that in the calculator. Uh, let's go ahead and take 9200 times two times pi. And that gives me 57,805.3. And because I'm trying to show you some neat stuff in this calculator, I'm going to be using my memory spaces in this calculator a lot. This does two things. It makes your calculations a little bit easier, but it also uh, helps you to get a more accurate final solution because you're essentially carrying all of the, the precision that the calculator can store from step to step. Okay, so let me just store this into uh, my A variable. Okay, now that I have that in the A variable, which by the way, this was, uh, you know, I'll just express it this way, 18,400 18, pi, uh, this is in radians per second. But I'm gonna mention here that I just stored that into variable A. So now that I've done that, how do I find ZC? All I gotta do, is take minus j and divide by what I just stored in a, right? And I'll use this notation when I've stored something in the calculator. Hopefully you can follow along without too much effort. Um, what do I need to do next here? Multiply a by the sum of 47 nanofarads and 22 nanofarads, okay? What is nano as a prefix? So I'm gonna say this is gonna be 42 plus 22, right? And this will be 10 to the negative nine, right? Farads, and farad is a what? Second per ohm? Remember that it's stored in A is a variable that is in radians per second. So the seconds are gonna go away and we'll just end up with ohms. So that tells me that ZC 
is going to be equal to, okay, um, here we go with uh, minus i, in the calculator we use i, divided by what I stored in a times uh, 47 plus 22 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay, and this gives me negative 250.71. Okay, and that would be negative j 250.71 ohms. Let me store that into b. So, so far what we've done is we have figured out an equivalent impedance for just the little uh, capacitors that are right there. What do you think might be next for finding an overall ZEQ for this whole upper branch of this, of this circuit? How about that uh, inductor next, right? So ZL, let me call it ZL. For ZL, it's going to be based on J omega L. And so what I will do with this is do J omega, which again is 18,400 pi radians per second. But that was stored in A, right? So I guess I could have put that too. Um, anyway, this multiplied by uh, the L value. And the L value up there was 2.6 millihenries. That is going to be 0 0.0026 henries. And a henry is an ohm second. So what I'll do with that is I will go ahead and calculate that. So we have I uh, times what I had stored in A times 0 0.0026 ohm seconds, right? And what that'll end up giving me is just ohms because the seconds will divide out. Okay, so that gives me 150.29 J ohms. Now let me store that into C. All right, so probably everyone is following on no problem right now. Um, what do I need to do next to find my ZEQ? Okay, because I've been storing things in variables, this ends up being pretty easy because what I essentially have is the little chunk right here. This is my Z sub C plus my little chunk right here. This is my uh, that is my uh, Z sub L, and then I can add 250 ohms to that, and I don't really have to process that for a resistor because its complex impedance is just equal to its resistance if you have a pure resistor, okay? So what I will do is go ahead and add these up, right? It's equal to ZC plus ZL uh, plus 250, is that what it was? 250 ohms, I think it was plus Z4, right? And Z4 was 30 ohms J. We have uh, plus J30 ohms, all right? So now let me do that one. B plus, oops, B plus C uh, plus 250 plus 30i. That's what I want, right? So that gives me 250 70.42 j ohms. Now, what I would like to do is store that into, let me store that, and I might, you know, kind of mess with some of your heads. I'm going to go all the way over and store that in variable f. And I do have a reason for that, but you'll see in a second. Okay, I think we're done with the first part of the problem because now what we have is all of our impedances are expressed in terms of complex impedances, right? Uh, I already had Z1, Z2, and Z3. Um, I've now converted Z4 to where I've combined it with all of the other components that I have up there, and that gives me an equivalent impedance right here. Okay, is there anything I need to do with my sources? I've got a VS that is 90 volts at an angle of 2.5 and an IS that's 100 milliamps at an angle of negative 30 degrees. I look at those, I don't think there's that much that I need to do with those right away. So I think they're already expressed in uh, phasor form and so we should be good on that. 
So what do you think we need to do next? Tell you what, I'm going to copy all this because this is going to be handy for me to know. And if I put a big heading on the next step that we want to do, I'm going to say we want to write nodal equations. Okay. Before you write nodal equations, though, what do you usually want to do? You want to identify a ground node, so that's right. You identify a ground node first. Then what do you want to do? Label, yeah, identify some nodes and label some voltages on those nodes relative to the ground, right? So let me do that and label this node over here with V1, this node over here with V2, and this node over here with V3, okay? Um, once I've done this, now let's take a hard look at the circuit and see whether or not we might want to identify any super nodes. Are there any super nodes for this circuit? Okay. You identify super nodes anywhere you have a voltage source, typically. Right? So we have a voltage source here that's actually connected to ground, which means that we do have a super node, but it happens to be a super ground node. That's a handy thing to have because what it does is it basically allows us to immediately write that V1 is equal to Vs. And that eliminates something that is a variable. Like it might have started out looking like a variable, but it's not because we are already setting V1 equal to Vs, right? So that's not really uh, going to have to be a big deal for us, right, to deal with V1. So because that's part of the, the ground node and it's part of a super node, what we're going to do next is move over to node 2 and start writing our KCL equations, nodal equations, if you will, for node 2. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, I'll tell you what, just to kind of keep everything in front of us, I'm going to do one more copy of this. So node 2, what does that nodal equation look like? I would say that our first thing we might want to look at is the current that flows from 2 toward 1. Right, so that would be V2 minus, and I could put V1, but instead let me put Vs, right? Because it just said V1 is equal to Vs, divided by Z1, okay? Then what? Plus V2 over Z2, right? Plus V3, oh, excuse me, V2 minus V3 over what? Z3. All right. And that looks like all the different paths you could have currents entering or leaving node 2. So I'm going to set that equal to 0. Okay. So that's node 2. Now let's do node 3. Okay. For node 3, it looks like one of the places that I could have current flowing is from 3 toward 1. So for that one, I would have V3 minus V1, but V1 is equal to Vs over ZEQ, okay? Plus uh, V3 minus V2 over Z3, okay? With me so far? Now what? Okay, plus Is and this is going to be equal to zero. All right, now I'm gonna make a suggestion for us here. Sometimes what you, we wanna do, or like what we've done in some of our problems in the past, is we've, at this point, wanted to substitute in all of these known values into our variables. I'm gonna suggest that that may not be our best strategy on this one, and rather than do that, let's try to do some manipulation in variable format first because we're going to have to be carrying a lot of stuff around if we don't do that, right? Because each one of these numbers is not just a number, it is a complex number. And so that tends to be a little bit heavy to try to carry that around on our sheet. Okay, if we're going to solve this system and we don't have a calculator to kind of just plug in the system and have it solve, right? What do you think our next best technique might be? Okay, there's a, there's a pretty simple one. It's usually the first one that they teach you 
whenever you're in algebra to solve a system of equations, and it is substitution. Okay. How do you think we might want to approach substitution for this problem? Look at the first equation. How many places does V3 appear? Just once, and so I'm going to suggest, why don't we take uh, that first equation and try to isolate V3, okay? We okay with that? So let's try to isolate V3 for that equation. So what we'll see there, I mean, it, I'll do it kind of in not too many steps. Let me uh, sort of, first of all, think about taking V3 over Z3 and moving it to the other side of the expression. And I'll actually do it kind of this way, where I'll do V3 over Z3 and set it equal to, now what I'll have is everything else in the equation can be on the other side of the expression, right? So what that would look like would be something like V2 times 1 over Z1 plus 1 over Z2 plus 1 over Z3, okay? And then I'll have minus Vs times 1 over Z1. Okay, I kind of did a couple of steps at once right there. Hopefully that's not too tough to follow. But all I did was I rearranged that expression up there so that I'm starting to get closer to having V3 all by itself on one side. Okay, now I can go through and divide through by Z3, and that'll leave me with V3 equal to V2 times Z3 over Z1 plus Z3 over Z2 plus Z3 over uh, Z3, which that's just going to be 1, right? Minus, here I'll have Vs times Z3 over Z1. Okay, so far so good? Now here's one of the, the best steps I have to show you, and it is that we can take those little chains of numbers right there, the Z3 over Z1, Z3 over Z2, etc. I can take those and I can evaluate them, right, and plug them into a variable in my calculator. That way I've got all of that collected and I can just call that variable whenever I need to. Okay, so I'm going to suggest, since we're not probably going to need our variable A that we used earlier for frequency, I'm going to reuse variable A and put this in A. Okay, then what I'll do is I will take all of this, because I know everything over here on the right, right? Vs I know, Z3 I know, and Z1 I know. I'm going to put that in to variable B. Okay, so I'm going to reuse those first two variables because I don't think I'm going to need what I had stored in them again. Okay, so here's what that would look like. I've already got uh, ZEQ stored into F. Why don't I take Z3 or Z1, to, Z1, Z2, and Z3 and store them into C, D, and E? I'll start with that because that'll make calculating this just a little bit easier. So let me take uh, minus I uh, times 200. All right, that would be my Z1, and I'm going to store that into variable C, okay? I'm going to take 100 uh, plus 75i right there, and I'm going to store that into D. And then I will take 200 angle negative 25 degrees, okay? And I will store that into E. Okay, and just so that I don't forget those, let me mark those up here. I won't need Z4 anymore because it's now collapsed into ZEQ, but I do have ZEQ stored into F. All right, so now that I've done all of this, let me get those stored into A and B, all right? So I'll take uh, Z3, which is now E, over Z1, which was C, plus Z3, which was E, divided by Z2, which is D, plus 1. That gives me a number, 2.1769 minus uh, 0.5 or so J, right? I don't really care. Why not? 
I'm going to store this into A. So I can go back and get that number if I need it, right? That was the result of punching all of those pieces in right there. What about B? Okay, for B, I'm going to have VS, right? And VS is 90 at an angle of 2.5. Now be careful here. Does it say 2.5 degrees? It does not, right? So we need to be careful with that and do 90 at an angle of 2.5, but I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to convert that right here to degrees since I'm in degree mode in my calculator. I'll multiply by 180 over pi. So we'll get that in there like that. Uh, but then I need to take all of this and multiply it by Z3 over Z1, right? So Z3 was E and Z1 was C. So that winds up giving me negative 79.288 minus 42.58J. But again, I don't really care because I'm going to take that number and I'm going to store that number into B. All right, so, so far so good. Are we, we comfortable? Now, here's what that does for me. Now when I go into the node 3 equation to do my substitution, all I need to do is substitute in something that is of the form of V3 is equal to V2 times A minus B, right? That's all I need to really plug in there. So what this becomes, everywhere I have a V3, I can do a V2 times A, right, minus B. So what I'm doing is I'm working on this uh, first term of node 3 over here, uh, minus Vs all of this over ZEQ. What is ZEQ? I had ZEQ stored into F, right? So I'm going to go ahead and, and put that substitution in there because I have ZEQ stored in F from up there. Okay. Then what? V3 again is just V2 times A minus uh, B. Okay. Then I'll have minus V2, all of this over Z3. Z3 I have stored in E, plus IS. What's IS? I don't have that stored anywhere yet. So let me just express that since it's 100 milliamps angle of negative 30. That's the same as saying 0.1 amps angle of minus 30 degrees, right, from up here. All right, and what is all this equal to? Zero. What is Vs? I guess I did one substitution here, but not the other. We know Vs, right? Vs is 90 volts at an angle of 2.5 radians. So let me go ahead and mention that I do know this here too. It's 90 volts angle, 2.5 radians. All right, a little bit more algebra now, okay? Let's collect everything that's multiplied by V2s and put them all together. What it looks like to me will happen there is that we will have uh, A over F plus A over E, okay, minus 1 over E, all of that multiplied by V2. Then we will subtract B over F. And then we will subtract B over E. Okay, so I think I've taken care of everything. Oh, I haven't taken care of what? Okay, I'll have a minus Vs, which is 90 volts at an angle of 2.5, over F, plus 0.1 at an angle of negative 30 degrees. And that should all be equal to zero. Okay, I know this is a little tedious. Trust me, it could be worse. Okay, so what's next? Now what we want to do is isolate V2 completely. Okay, what that will look like is I move all these terms to the other side of the equation, right? That means I've got B over F plus B over E plus 90 volts angle 2.5 over F 
uh, minus 0.1 amps. I guess I dropped my amps up there, but that should be amps. Uh, angle of minus 30 degrees. And all of this is going to be divided by what I had collected next to V2 over there, right? A over F plus A over E minus 1 over E. All right. Now, if you felt like all that was tedious, uh, this is where maybe you will uh, enjoy it a little bit more. Because I have everything that I need now right here in one expression, along with the things that are stored in my calculator, that I can find V2. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and punch that in. Um, I'm going to do kind of a big set of parentheses to carry all of the stuff in the numerator right there. So I'm going to have B over F plus B over E plus 90 at an angle of here. Make sure that you don't forget that we need to deal with our, uh, the fact that 2.5 is in radians and my calculator is in degree mode. So I want to do this as 2.5 times 180 over pi. Okay, that divided by F. Then I'm going to have uh, minus 0.1 at an angle of negative 30. All right, so that's all of my numerator. Now I'm going to divide by my denominator. My denominator is going to have A over F plus A over E minus 1 over E. Hopefully you were watching as I did all that, so maybe you could catch any of my uh, mistakes or anything. Maybe you will. I don't know. Let's, let's hit the equal button and see if I like the result. Good news is this agrees with what I have in my notes right here, so I think I got everything punched in there properly. Okay, 62 point, uh, we'll say 62.98 minus 25.93J. What are the units on this? Okay, this will be volts, right? Now, I don't really want to express it in rectangular coordinates as much as I want to express it in uh, polar coordinates. So I'm going to hit uh, the conversion there to get that into polar coordinates. That ends up giving me 68.1 volts at an angle of negative 157.6 degrees. Okay, and if we're going to interpret that in terms of time domain, that says that the voltage wave that is at node 2, which is up here, is going to have an amplitude of 68.1 volts and a phase shift of negative 157.6 degrees. Okay. Was that what we were looking for? All right, go back up here. It said way at the beginning, we were supposed to try to find a voltage phaser across the current source. Well, shucks, we maybe could have done that if right at the beginning I could have expressed everything in terms of V3, right? But don't worry. Let's say you chose the wrong one, right? And now you want to get the other one. What do we need to do? Yeah, I already have this expression right here, right? That expression is useful again, right? Because I still have my number stored in A, and I still have my number stored in B, all I need to do is plug in V2 right here, and I'll be able to find V3. Right? So what that looks like in the calculator is that V3 is going to be equal to this result, which, let me go ahead and store it just in case for some reason I want it later. Let me store that into X. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is take that result, x, multiply it by a, and subtract b. Okay, That's, again, going to report that to me in rectangular coordinates. I would prefer to see it in polar, so I'm going to go ahead and convert it. And that gives me 73.13 volts at an angle of 165.8 degrees. And that is the final answer, okay? Because that is the voltage phaser 
that expresses what the voltage is across the current source. If we go back up and look at the drawing up here, right, V3 is the voltage, you know, because V3 is expressed relative to ground, right? So V3 is the voltage across that current source, right? And so we uh, have now found what that value is. All right, question for you now. Did you like that? Okay, now I see a lot of heads saying, no, I did not like that very much. Why did you not like that very much? You just didn't like it. Why not? Ah, so you haven't learned how to store variables in your calculator yet. This is a good skill to know, right? And it gets even better once you're dealing with complex numbers, right? Um, let, me, uh, let me say this. I think probably some of you don't like it because, man, that's a lot of steps. A lot of chances for messing something up, okay? And you don't like that, right? So my suggestion is this. Do try to be very careful as you write down all of your work, right? If you try to use this technique, I really recommend that you try to clearly label. If you start storing things into variables in your calculator, I tried to do a pretty good job of this as I went along of labeling, here's what I'm storing into that variable. That way, if you need to go back later, you can do that. And then the other thing, little warning I'll give you is try to be careful about overriding something. Think real hard before overriding something in one of your storage locations because, you know, what if you need that number again, right? Um, you know, if you're about to overwrite one, make sure you've got the number written somewhere else on the page so you can go back and get that information again if you need to, okay? And then lastly, um, one of the advantages that I have when I work up here on this emulator is that this emulator doesn't shut off on me, okay? If you're working in one of these real calculators, they tend to have an auto power off feature, right? Once they do that, this one, uh, actually I'll say, I, I don't know that all of them do this, but this one, if it auto powers off, you're gonna have to start over. So one of the things that you probably need to be in the habit of doing if you're trying to use this properly either in homework or on a test is you want to make sure that you sort of continually keep the calculator awake, right? Sort of almost a habit to go over there and punch a key or two to keep the calculator from auto powering down, okay? Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to deal with this instead of doing all of this on paper and in a calculator, wouldn't it be nice if we had a more powerful tool to be able to do this kind of work, okay? first question someone has is, on a test? You don't need it on a test. You know how to do this by hand. It'll be fine, right? But we're also only going to give you something that is probably this big or smaller, right, if we give one like this to you on a test, okay? What if we give, what if at some point in your life you encounter a problem that's bigger than this? Wouldn't it be nice to have another tool? The answer is probably so. That is the topic of my next example.